Do you know how important the 2024 recruiting class is? It's as important as the 2003 class. You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, fight on everyone. I'm your host, Mark Culkin, and thank you for making Locked On USC your first listen every day, whether you're watching on YouTube or wherever you like to download your podcast. We are free, and I really do appreciate your support. If you are watching on YouTube, you haven't become a subscriber yet, it's easy. It's free. Hit the subscribe button, and it's done. Hit that thumbs up. Both mean a whole heck of a lot to the show. And this episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com forward slash locked on college. And when you enter your promo code locked on college, they're going to throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every single order. That 2003 uh, class that Pete Carroll brought in was a result of what the team accomplished in 2002. That was a season USC finished off Iowa in the Orange Bowl. Carson Palmer had his Heisman Trophy. Iowa had the Heisman runner-up and Bradley Banks. And it wasn't just the 11-win season. It was how they did it. But let's, real quickly, that 2003 recruiting class had some really some big-time program changers. Reggie Bush, Wendell White, Cedric Ellis, Steve Smith, Ryan Khalil, uh, Feely Mawala. I, I'm, na- I'm leaving off a whole bunch of names, but I... I one player that didn't, even, that didn't even make it to USC, unfortunately, was supposed to be the next greatest linebacker in the lineage of USC linebackers. May he rest in peace, Dreon Rucker. All of those guys that I mentioned, they bought into Pete Carroll and Ed Orgeron. They bought into their vision. <clears throat> so far, the 2024 class has a wide receiver, a tight end, and a running back. That's the first group of commitments that will be going into the big conference when USG joins in 2024. The big conference is traditionally, they've been known as, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust. Uh, you know, they use the run to set up a pass. Weather is always a for whatever reason, weather's an, always an element when you talk to the fans of the Big Ten. Um, and it, it can be. It does play a role in, in some play calling. I remember a game a couple of years ago, um, C.J. Stroud, Ohio State's quarterback, I think he was playing at Northwestern. Wind was a really big factor. He was like one for 18. I'm hyperbolizing, but he had some, not that much. He had a really bad numbers. So... Um, what you're saying is, you know, what what am I saying? Is why why would a bunch of freshmen that aren't even expected to contribute on the field when USC makes that move, at least the majority of them, why would the 2024 class be the most important? Well, the 2023 class, uh, they went big uh, in, in the trenches, both sides of the ball. And a few of those guys are going to be significant tr- contributors this season. However, it's the 2024 class that's going to sell the future. Once USC is an official member of the big conference, this is the class that will, I'm not going to say make or break, but it's going to make that transition a lot more appealing to, the, in the fu- to future classes. No one is concerned about USC's offense as long as Lincoln Riley is the head coach. And we know Riley is loyal to his coaches, especially his defensive coordinator, Alex Grinch. You know, as I pointed out, right now this class is three deep, literally three players deep, and they're all skilled players on offense. The, The 2024 class is going to be an indictment, uh, good or bad, on whether or not future recruits are going to want to play for Alex Grinch's side of the ball. 
I mean, let's just call it what it is. Here's a, uh, I'm going to read you a statement from a recruit who just finished his visit to USC. Quote, we didn't really dive too deep into the defensive scheme, Miles Davis said. I've heard the narrative surrounding the defense, but it was year one and they don't really have all their players yet. It'll take a couple of years to get guys like me and some other dogs to come in and make plays, end quote. He continued, I'm going to try and move a couple of my visits up because USC is only taking two safeties and I can see myself here and I don't want to miss out and have to settle for somewhere else, end quote. So it, look, if you follow me on We Are SC, then you also follow our recruiting uh, maven, Scott Schrader, who let everyone know uh, recently that it's going to be the first three cornerbacks and first two safeties that commit. That's going to be USC's secondary class based on the numbers that uh, they're, they're charting out. So if other players, you know, leave, that, that, that could, you know, change the calculus. But for now, you're looking at a five-member secondary class in 2024. And oh, by the way, <coughs> pardon me, as I mentioned on yesterday's episode of Locked on USC, Marcellus Williams, younger brother of Max Williams, St. John Bosco, uh, Scott Schrader, he broke his rule, and he set his confidence level for USC getting Marcellus Williams at, in not so many words, quote, he's coming to USC. Like I mentioned yesterday, confidence level was really high. If Scott goes in with, I'm feeling really good, it, that's a pretty good sign. Now, I talked about the guys USC is interested in in the secondary, including you know, Sione Lalea, Xavier Brown, Dakota Fields. I've also talked about the June recruiting visits and how important those visits are. So if Grinch can convince others that are going to be visiting this in, in these next few weeks to not have to settle and come to USC, including the linebackers from Bosco that everyone wants, and the safety that is committed to Georgia, Peyton Woodyard, you know, maybe he can be the other safety along with Miles Davis. Then others, they're going to buy in, including recruits like Aiden Breland from Modern Day, Eldrick Houston from Buford, Georgia, plus other dogs, as Miles Davis put it, to make plays. The 2024 class has to be Top 10. I'm using finger quotes. It has to be top 10. Um, it's necessary from an optics standpoint because USC has to go into the big conference with recruiting momentum. Otherwise, uh, some of those names that I mentioned, they're going to end up at the Ohio State or at Michigan or in the SEC or at Oregon. Let me, let, me re, let me go back to, to what Miles Davis said. This is really important. Quote, I've heard the narrative surrounding the defense, but it was, year, it was year one and they don't really have all their players yet. Again, that statement said it loud and clear. Right, let's use his word. You know, the dogs, they're barking at the gate. They want to come in. You will see, that, look, if you're following a recruiting right now, they're going after all the big dogs. They're not settling for, you know, what you've been familiar with when Clay Helton was the coach, settling for the quote-unquote three stars that everyone kvetches about, whines, moans, if you don't know what kvetch means. Uh, all these recruits that are looking at USC in 2024, they want to see what happens in year two on the field at USC. USC, that 2023 class, they loaded up along with the offensive line and the defensive line. You still need to bring some more guys in in this class, 2024. However, the transfer portal has already delivered Bear Alexander. So everything that's been built up cumulatively in 2023, the recruiting class, which filled a lot of its needs, hitting the transfer portal, all that will end up being dust in the wind 
if the 2024 class isn't elite. You know, it's just, it's just going to make, it'll be an uphill climb for USC once they are officially a part of the big conference. That's why 2024 is the most important recruiting class since that 2003 class. Because that 2003 class, combined with that 2002 class, it put USC over the top. It set them on that trajectory to just, we're going to kick ass, we're going to take names. They went on a 34-game winning streak. Heisman's, Reggie Bush, Matt Leinart. It was just, it was a juggernaut. That's what this class needs to be, especially when USC transitions to the big conference. Hey, uh, I'm pretty comfortable right now. You know why? Because I'm wearing my bird dogs. I got my pair of shorts on. You got to try bird dogs. Uh, shorts and their pants. You guys, I'm telling you, they f if you like to feel like you're not wearing anything underneath, then you need to try these things. Because I feel great when I'm wearing my bird dogs. Because we know that comfort below that belt line, it means everything. And I mean everything. They've got this really stretchy fabric that kind of adapts to any any type of body that's wearing them. And when I'm wearing them, I can go from the practice field straight up to the press box. And that's because Bird Dogs, they give me the freedom to wear one pair of shorts or pants anywhere. I can wear them to a meeting. I can wear them on a date. I can even, hang in, I can even wear them hanging out when I'm interviewing players and coaches. So if you are a college football couch potato, You've got a dad bod. Bird dogs can even make your bodies look good. So pick up the laptop. If you're leaning back on the couch, go to birddogs.com forward slash locked on college. And when you enter promo code locked on college, they're going to throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every single order. And that's pretty cool. Look, either USC and its vetting process are really bad at their jobs or somebody isn't being completely transparent. USC has had a history of challenges, internal issues, and I'm putting that mildly. I could bring up the name George Tyndall. I could bring up the dean of the business school who many feel is getting the Mike Bone treatment. Um, I can bring up the dean of the medical school. Each, Regardless, each of those situations happened prior to the hiring of Mike Bone, USC's now former athletic director. So you would think that when it was time to hire another department head, a.k.a. the athletic department, um, USC, they, they turned it to a, a vetting firm, a research for, uh, firm called Turnkey, Turnkey Search. Who, they're a subsidiary of Turnkey Sports and Entertainment. And they are the ones who essentially placed Mike Bone as the director of athletics for USC. Um, he replaced Lynn Swan, who resigned in September of that year, amid investigations um, within the athletic department. Sound familiar? <clears throat> so back in 2016, USC used a firm called Newman Associates, and they were the ones who recruited Lynn Swan to be USC's athletic director. So we're now 0 for 2 using these types of... Uh, I guess, uh, investigation, investigative entities that are supposed to vet and find the best candidate possible. So who should USC use for its search this time? Which, and I'm using finger quotes for you, those of you who aren't watching, which person of integrity will lead USC's athletic department? Uh, those were Carol Fultz's words when, uh, when she introduced Mike Bone back in 2019. And here's the question. Should we have the confidence in USC to get it right? 
I mean, they've tried two different search firms. Obviously, one, well, one was more successful than the other. Mike Bones got a resume that he could lean back on and say, hey, look what I did. I'll get to that in a moment. But part of the process back in 2019 included, it had, USC used an 11-member search committee, It was, and that was, at the time, chaired by a USC trustee, Suzanne Nora Johnson. It also included faculty, staff, alumni, and two student athletes. And at that time, the committee conducted three listening sessions with 200 student athletes, coaches, and staff, and that eventually shaped the candidate criteria that led to Mike Bones' hiring. That part sounds like, okay, great. They've narrowed down who, you know, the, the, the final candidates were. And then there was, a, I guess, three listening sessions. And everybody kind of got an opportunity to listen and, and have some input. Here's the thing. This next hire has some really big shoes to fill. And if we look at Mike Bone's accomplishments during his tenure... Uh, he's going to be in the discussion for the greatest USC athletic director ever. I mean, let's not forget, he won the National AD of the Year Award in 2022. And he brought in Lincoln Riley. And he hired Lindsey Gottlieb. Not the senator <laughs> that I mentioned on last yesterday's episode of Locked on USC. I apologize. I don't know why I had Lindsey Graham's name in my mouth. Lindsey Gottlieb is USC's women's basketball head coach, and Mike Bone hired her. And that was an instant turnaround for the women's program, who made the postseason for the first time in forever. He also retained Andy Enfield. He also helped usher USC away from the Pac-12's money pit. Uh, oh, by the way, and I'll talk about this in the next segment, USC and every other Pac-12 school is getting hit with a Larry Scott tax uh, for getting too big of a refund check, so to speak. Anyways, but again, if nothing else was to come out of this investigation that forced Mike Bones' early resignation, other than essentially he was resting on his laurels, and, you know, obviously there was some that were frustrated working under him, Mike Bone is going to be remembered for accomplishing, accomplishing a lot in his uh, four years as USC's athletic director. I have a feeling that the next person who gets this gig is going to be much younger, with a lot more energy, and something to prove. Uh, like I said, Mike did a lot in four years. So you're... The, this next person is going to have to come in and, and figure out, hey, you know, that person did all this. I, I can't just come in and, and sit behind the scenes. That person has to understand that football and the transition to the big conference, those are priorities 1A and 1B. Here's where we're at. I'm making, I'm producing this episode for Locked On USC that you'll see Wednesday, your first listen, every day. Which means it's sometime on Tuesday. It's the end of the day, Tuesday. I'll give you that much of a hint. There's been no update from USC with regards to the transition team, the direction that USC is planning to go. And for me, that's mildly concerning considering USC's history since it's kind of obvious that something was going to happen eventually. I mean, that LA Times article that came out, it, it basically moved up the timeline where when no one at USC wanted to answer their inquiries. And once that happened, LA Times said, all right, well, we're going to run the story. Here we go. So USC can't take too much time with its transition team Again, and this goes back to having the confidence level for USC to get the job done and pick the right person. You know, Carol Folt thought she had the right person. Hindsight's 2020. 
turnkey. They brought in Mike Bone. They said, this is the guy you need. Before that, USC used a different firm, Lynn Swan. This is the guy you need. Both were forced to resign early for different reasons. I don't know if we'll ever know that the full reason why Mike was asked to leave. We're only kind of scratching the surface at this point. So, again, once the investigation was started, um, or at least when it got to that point when everyone knew, especially the powers that be and be behind closed doors, that, uh, that Mike was going to be forced to step down, that transition team should have been ready to step in right then. Once that statement was released, this is what we're doing. These are the steps we're taking. Well, remember, Mike resigned Friday last week. You're making Locked on USC your first listen. Today's Wednesday. It's hump day. Still no news from USC. So we'll see where this goes. This is why the confidence level from people who want to believe in USC have a hard time. It's because of stuff like this. USC should have been prepared. They weren't. I mentioned the uh, the Larry Scott tax a few minutes ago. It's going to cost USC another almost $6 million to get out of this Pac-12 dumpster fire. I mean, it's ridiculous. Every time you turn around, oh, by the way, did you hear the Pac-12 lost this much money? Or the Pac-12, yada, yada, yada. Under Larry Scott's direction. So, yeah, about $5.7 million, almost $6 million. Every Pac-12 school has to incur this cost. Why? Fortunately, they don't have to incur the cost of the lease that they uh, they they got out of from the Pac-12 uh, their Pac-12 offices when they took over the two floors of this building in downtown San Francisco. Uh, they converted them into the Pac-12 TV networks. Well, the lease says when you leave, you got to return the building to its original shape and form. The Pac-12 is absorbing that cost, which is about ten million dollars per school. So that's $120 million that the Pac-12 is eating. The schools don't have to cough up that money. The schools do have to figure out where $5.7 million, $5 million is coming from because of a Comcast um, counting error. It, it, it just <laughs> a big, giant mess. Um, essentially, that each school is overpaid. USC can absorb that kind of cost. They have deep pockets where they don't want to pay it, but they can absorb it. It could be worse. It could be Wazoo. Washington State President Kirk Schultz said Washington State Athletics will have, quote, a temporary freeze on all current and future vacant positions until further review as well as a pause on non-essential travel, purchases, and new professional development, end quote, because of significant decrease in Pac-12 revenue distribution as a result of overpayments from one of the conference media partners, and that still needs to be resolved. So, like I said, it could be worse. USC could be in that situation where they need to hire an athletic director, they don't have the funds. Washington State's current athletic director, his name is Pat Chun. And he was a candidate the last time around when USC was looking to fill this role that Mike Bone eventually received. Pat Chun, he was at Ohio State, so he knows the terrain of the big conference. He knows all about USC, and he's a football guy Let's just throw this out there because this might be the perfect opportunity for him to throw his hat 
back into the ring, pull the ripcord, bail out of Pullman. Is this the right time for him to do that? Or does he not really have a choice? I, I mean, is this the final Jenga piece that's just going to bring the whole Pac-12 conference down? Washington State can't afford this. We know the UC system is broke as a joke. They're trying to make UCLA pay Cal, you know, some sort of exit tax. Um, I don't know. It's just really interesting to see how this is all happening at this point right now. Now you know why USC and UCLA wanted to get the heck out of Dodge, get into the big conference. Yeah, they've got their own issues right now. They're still trying to finalize their own TV deal. Nevertheless, there's going to be a lot more money there. Again, USC could absorb this 5.7 million hit. But everything that's going on right now, USC looking for a new athletic director, making sure that they've, you know, they're not losing millions of dollars one day when they thought they had it already in their coffers. A lot going on around USC. So... There's always something going on, and that's why you always need to make sure you're making Locked on USC your first listen every day so I can bring you all the news and notes, all the behind-the-scenes stuff. And I'm starting to gather more intel of what actually happened or what's to have alleged to have happened with Mike Bone. And as I continue to gather that, I will bring it out, and I will talk about it. But as I said, if things were as salacious as that LA Times article would like you to believe, you don't allow somebody to resign, especially when you bring in that particular investigative firm. You fire them. Like I said, USC, Mike Bone, Carol Folt, they knew this was eventually going to happen. They should have been better prepared. Anyways, we've talked about recruiting. We covered more of the athletic directors. I'm going to have more for you tomorrow on another episode of Locked on USC. But until then, everyone, you know what to do.